What's up, y'all? How you doing? Happy Black History Month and happy Tuesday for us to gather together in the gathering and have a good time together. I hope you've had a good week so, thus far. I certainly have. As a matter of fact, every week is a good week. I don't care what happens. Some crazy things happen all the time, but I am determined that I will give the Lord the praise, glory, and honor. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. How about you? Well, I certainly want to tell you how excited I am about this series that we're doing because we've been talking about the power to choose. This is the fifth installment of that discussion. And I know that it seems like um, we've been going through some very basic things, but you know, we're resetting this year. And so we're going back to the basics and we're making sure that all the bases are covered, or at least the important ones in our lives. And so this um, month we've been talking about, or this series rather, we've been talking about the power to choose. And today we're going to be talking about choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that we are to choose to accept God's forgiveness of us. Now we must choose to forgive others. And so I invite you to look with me at the scriptures as we begin tonight. We're looking at Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 23 through 35. Would you get your Bibles out and read with me? Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 23 through 35. You got it? Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he said, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Now look with me at the screen and you will find the second passage of scripture that we're looking at tonight is from Colossians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 14. As a matter of fact, you can read it with me. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's pray. God, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight because you, O oh God, are our strength and our redeemer. 
We pray, oh God, that you would speak to each of our hearts tonight in a way that we cannot ignore it. God, you know the relationships that are broken. You know the relationships where that are shattered in a million pieces, God, and need to be put back together again. God, give us the courage and the strength to do what you teach us to do tonight, what you remind us of tonight. Give us the courage and the strength through your Holy Spirit, God, to do what may, may seem impossible or at least hard for each of us. And we'll be so careful to give you the praise, glory, and honor, not just tonight, but for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every day of our lives, we are offended, hurt, wronged in one way or another by what someone else says or does. A person makes a joke and entertains a crowd in the classroom or office at our expense. Someone explodes at some small comment you made, exposes a shared secret, or perhaps the infraction was much more serious. A loved one has rejected or abandoned you, a trusted friend betrayed you, or your spouse walks out on you and leaves you hanging with all the children, the debt, and the ongoing bills. Your brother or sister has stolen from you or your parents while you were just trying to help them get on their feet. You've been unjustly accused, lied on, talked about, or terminated from a job for no justifiable reason. Who among us does not have good reason to be angry, bitter, to nurse a grudge against another, and never speak to them again? When we think of what they said or did to us, in our minds, we are justified in never, ever forgiving them, even though the Bible says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, as even as God in Christ has forgiven you. But you're not the least bit interested in forgiving them. You have conveniently overlooked or not taken seriously that precept in Scripture. Even though you consider yourself a Christian or seeking to please God and become more like his son every day, you're not trying to get with forgiveness at this moment. And you think you have some pretty good reasons for not forgiving others. First of all, you would say forgiveness is a sign of weakness and I'm not weak. I want everybody to know that they just can't walk over me and do anything they want to to me. The other person hasn't shown any remorse. Why should I forgive them? I'll forgive them when he or she says, I'm sorry. And the hurt is too big. Do you know what they did for me? I mean, it's unconscionable. I can't forgive if I can't forget. I still remember what they did to me. I don't think I will ever forget it. If I forgive them, they may try to think they could do it to me again. Somebody needs to make them pay. They don't deserve to be forgiven. Look at what they've done to me, what they put me through. And you expect me to forgive them, to just let them off the hook? That's not fair. My first question of the evening or questions would be, which one of these reasons best describes your unwillingness to forgive? If you have a different reason other than the one that I, ones that I listed here and feel comfortable sharing it, then please do. But know this, forgiveness isn't fair. But forgiveness isn't about fairness nor is it about asking for more trouble from the one who did you wrong. Forgiveness is not just about the offender. It's also about you and your freedom. George Atkinson says, it really doesn't matter if the person who hurt you deserves to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. You have things to do and you want to move on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Marsha Ford says in the sacred art of forgiveness, it's about letting go of your past, changing your present and protecting your future. It's about being healthy, making a better life for yourself and perhaps making a better world. 
How many of us are being held hostage by memories of past hurts, crimes committed against us, the pain we bear from being separated or estranged from the people we love, all because we are unwilling to forgive? Some of us live and work, study and go to church with folks we have not forgiven. It has been easy for us to just stick unresolved conflicts in a mental drawer and leave it there until that space is filled to overflowing and we realize we have to make a big dump. You need to get rid of all the times people have hurt you, disappointed you, the rejection and the situations that unfolded in unexpected, in unexpected and painful ways. You've been carrying around that garbage too long, way past its expiration date, and it's weighing you down. You've been allowing things to swirl around in your mind and heart, continually stirring up bitterness and pain. And sometimes it happens without your even noticing where it comes from. Well, it's deep within. And so it just springs up. As a matter of fact, I was driving to work today and I thought about something somebody said to me and it made me mad all over again. And it just came out of nowhere. And I really thought that I had forgiven it, but we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But what I wanna make sure you understand tonight is you cannot move on with your life fully becoming all that God has destined you to become in Christ until you forgive release the offense, the person, and yourself. James McDonald says, God didn't make you with the capacity to carry around the residue of all the negatives from your past. He doesn't expect you to store it or ignore it. What God expects of you and what you must do for yourself is choose to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice. If you're seated next to somebody in the room, look at them and say, you've got to choose to forgive. If you're there all by yourself, talk to yourself. Look in the mirror and say, you've got to choose to forgive. You are free to forgive because of who you are in Christ. It is the apostle Paul who makes this clear to us in Colossians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 14, the passage that I just read to you, or we read together. What Paul is addressing in this chapter is that as Christians, we have been raised with Christ and must live like it. Now that we are in Christ, we've been made brand new. We have a new identity and a new capacity. And you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a what? New creature or new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are brand new. But the reality is, though we are genuinely new, we are not completely <laughs> new. What do you mean by that, Pastor? We're still in process. Aren't you glad that I say this regularly? It kind of lets you off the hook because you're not expected to be perfect. You are perfected in Christ. God is still working on us by his spirit to bring about substantial changes as we are being transformed into the image of Christ daily. It's a process. The way Paul talks about it in this text is, though we are new, we are still wearing the old clothes. It's like taking a shower or a bath and getting all cleaned up, smelling good, and then putting on those old, dirty, stinky clothes again. Phew! Why in the world would you do that? Well, that's what we're doing. We're brand new, but we're still wearing those, some old, stinky clothes. Hi, you got me, Anita. <laughs> You have to take off the old clothes and put on the new clothes. He describes the old that needs to be taken off in verses 5 through 11. And you can go back and read that later, Colossians 3, 5 through 11. And the new, particularly in terms of our relationships in 12 through 14. Paul says that the way that we are to deal with one another is to forgive. Forgiveness is what God gives to free us and others from the weight of relational failures. 
Let's get clear about this. You already know, I don't have to tell you, we are going to have conflict. We are going to hurt one another. We are going to make mistakes in our relationships. We are going to fail in our relationships. And we have a choice. We either have to bear with those individuals, be impatient with them, or we have to forgive. What I wanna focus on tonight is the central message in this passage, forgive, as the Lord forgave you. Parallel passages found in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Kathleen, how did God forgive us? Generously and graciously. When we repent, we are forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future through the death of Jesus Christ. You already know that. Every one of your sins has been forgiven. And when you make new ones, which we do daily, right? Sometimes multiple times a day, then we have to confess those sins and God forgives us. So by definition, every Christian is a forgiven person. Our new life in Christ begins the moment we commit or admit our sin to a holy God and receive his forgiveness that was purchased for us at Calvary. Forgiveness is a gift. It cannot be earned. Forgiveness, says Paul, is a past tense. It's a past event. God has forgiven you. You are forgiven. Forgiveness trumps justice. With justice, the offender pays. In forgiveness, the offended pays and sets the offender free. The offended releases the offender from any obligation that he or she has to the offended. Forgiveness doesn't change our past. Our sins don't disappear, okay? but forgiveness changes the power of the past. It can no longer control our present and our future. We are redeemed, set free from the penalty of sin. So in other words, now that we've been forgiven, we have no obligation to God because the sin has been dealt with. Now, Paul says, we stand before God as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Now that we have this new identity in Christ, we have to act like it. We've got to live like it. And what does that mean? Forgiven people are to be forgiving. Listen to this. We will never truly lay hold to the forgiveness we have in Christ until we learn to forgive others. The fact that we've been forgiven makes us forgiving. And when Paul says that we are to forgive whatever grievances, whatever grievances we may have a Against another, the word grievance only appears here in the Greek New Testament. And it refers to a moral fault or wrong, a complaint grounded in objectively sinful behavior. It looks like I may be having a little problem, so I need you to pray because see my, I don't want this thing to freeze up now because the devil will not let, doesn't want you to hear what I'm saying. In the name of Jesus, everything is cool. Forgiveness is not easy for any of us, but forgiveness is foundational to the life of a Christian. We are forgiven. All of us have sinned against God, incurred the wrath of God, and we're under the eternal punishment of God until Christ redeemed us, paid the price to set us free from condemnation. We didn't deserve to be forgiven. Forgiveness is an act of grace. God didn't give us what we deserved. 
That's what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is so awesome. The word forgiveness in the Greek is a compound word consisting of two words translated in English from and to sin. To forgive is to send away, dismiss, be done with, let go of, to be released from the penalty and power of. When God forgives, he literally sends our sins away. He dismisses them. He treats us as if the sin had never been committed. If God no longer condemns us, how dare we condemn someone else? Hallelujah. That's right, Taisha. If God forgives us, we must be willing to forgive those who sin against us. What? I hear some of y'all say it. <laughs> you don't know what horrible things people have done to me. I know you've been seriously sinned against and the last thing you want to do is forgive. The sin is too big. It doesn't matter the size of the sin. Uh, that doesn't justify our holding on to it and refusing to forgive. God doesn't withhold forgiveness from us, Shatika or Pamela, because our sins are too big. It doesn't matter. I can never forgive that person. I've been wounded. I've been hurt badly. Forgiveness is letting them off the hook. They need to hurt like they hurt me. They need to suffer like I've suffered. They need to pay for what they've done. Besides, if I forgive them, they may try to do it again. They will pay. God will make them pay. Second Thessalonians 1 6 says, God is just. He will pay back trouble <laughs> to those who trouble you. In Romans 12, verses 17 through 19, listen to the words and then you can read it again later. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. It is our duty to forgive others as we have been forgiven. All righty then, we say, like Peter, we ask the question, how many times am I supposed to forgive? my brother or sister, when he or she sins against me up to seven times. Now you might laugh, but Peter thought he was being quite <laughs> generous. He was serious, Deborah. He thought that he was being generous because according to tradition at that time, three or four times was the most you were supposed to forgive. And when he says seven, well, he was up in the ante. He doubled it. Jesus' answer to Peter illustrates that Peter was thinking in earthly human terms rather than godly terms. Jesus said to him, listen, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times, or as it reads in the King James Version, 70 times seven. Now, you know, Peter quickly calculated that in his head, like many of you have just done. And he thought to himself, 490 times and said, come on, Jesus, give me a break. What Jesus was really saying is, we just need to forgive as many times as it takes. I see you, Anita. Don't worry about setting a limit on forgiveness, counting how many times you have forgiven someone, telling them, I'm not going to forgive you another time. Do you know that I've already forgiven you 50 times in this marriage? Do you know how many times I have put up with your stuff and just written it off? I'm not going to do it again. Oh, but what you need to understand is, Forgiveness is not a one-time 
event or an act. It's an attitude. Mm. We're to develop a forgiving spirit, an attitude of mercy like God has done with us. How many times has God forgiven you? Let's not even talk about in our lifetime. How about just this week? We're only three days into the week. How many times has he forgiven you? Because you see, God doesn't count. Besides, as he makes clear in the parable, he tells in response to Peter's question about an unforgiving servant, when you are fussing about forgiving, the sin that you are struggling to forgive doesn't compare to what you have been forgiven of. It doesn't matter what it is. But in Matthew 18, 23 through 35, you know, I just read that to you earlier. Jesus tells the story of a king who wanted to settle his debts with his servants. Well, one of the servants who had been stealing from him owed him over 10,000 talents or bags of gold. Or what would a man amount to about 10 million today or more? There was no way that the servant could ever pay it back. So the master, as was the custom of that day, ordered that the servant, his wife, his children, and all that he owed had to be sold to pay the debt. The servant fell on his knees and began to beg for mercy, asking the master to be patient with him and promising that he would pay back everything, Donna. The master fell the man's pain in his heart. He knew the man couldn't pay him back. So with compassion, he canceled the debt and let him go. If somebody owed you $10 million, would you cancel the debt? Oh my God. You'd have to pray about that, but we're not God, are we? Oh my God. It was clearly an act of grace and mercy, Bill, just like God has done for you and me. But the forgiven servant didn't learn his lesson. You see, he went out and found a fellow servant who owed him about a hundred dollars, <laughs> grabbed him, choked him, and demanded his money. His fellow servant did to him the same thing that he had done to the king. He fell on his knees and begged for mercy, asking that the man be patient with him. He would pay back all that he owed, which was impossible given what he made. But the forgiven servant failed to extend to the debtor the same grace and mercy that had been extended to him. When the master heard what the man had done, he called him and said to him, you wicked servant, I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, he turned the man over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. I guess he would spend an eternity there. He could never pay it back, especially not in jail. Jesus then said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart, underlined from the heart. We tend to forget about the grace that God has extended towards us, refusing to forgive others the most trifling, for the most trifling of offenses. When God has forgiven us for things that would not even compare, we are to extend forgiveness to others and stop trying to hold the offense over their head, punishing them as a way of getting even with them, holding grudges, reminding them 10 times a day of what they have done, talking ugly to them if we talk to them at all. Oh my God. If we don't do differently. God is going to get us. Do you understand that? He is not going to put up with this. And if we are honest with ourselves, Mary, the person who is the most imprisoned is the one who refuses to forgive. Unforgiveness is a jail cell. It's like a cancer 
that eats away at the inside of us as it holds us in its deadly grip. We will never be free until we learn to forgive from the heart, underline from the heart. Forgiveness is foundational. Forgiveness is an act of grace. And it's also an act of obedience. We are commanded to forgive others. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> it ain't optional. We are commanded. If we love God, then we'll do what God has asked us to do. A life of faith in God is a life of obedience. Some people who struggle with forgiveness give the excuse, I don't know how to forgive. The way to learn to forgive is to forgive. That's how you learn everything else. You learn how to read by reading. You learn how to talk by talking. You learn how to drive by driving. Just do it. We become forgiving by forgiving dying. Forgiveness is an act of our wills, not a surge of emotions. Forgiveness is not easy. It is one of the hardest things that God asks us to do. There are times when we literally have to ask God to help us to forgive. Perhaps you've read or heard the story of Corrie ten Boom when she went back to Germany to preach in 1947. Her family had been caught hiding Jews, as you know. She and her sister had been sent to Ravensbrück, one of the Nazi camps, where she had watched her sister and others die. After the war, in one of her meetings, she was teaching on forgiveness. After the service, a long line of persons waited to speak to her, one of whom was a former guard at the prison camp where she was. She recognized him, but he didn't know her. He came up to her, complimented her on her message, stuck out his hand, and she couldn't respond. A flood of memories flooded over her, and she just fumbled around in her bag. She didn't know what to do. Then he told her that he had been one of the prison guards at Ravensbrook, but was saved, not saved at the time. But since that time, the Lord had forgiven him of all the cruel things that he had done. He then said, would you forgive me? He asked her, would you forgive me? I'd like to hear it from your lips. But she stood there frozen. How could she forgive the man who was possibly responsible for killing her, her sister and so many others and imprisoning her and depriving her of food? Ah, it was an ugly experience. He shook, he reached out his hand to shake her hands and she couldn't move. She knew that God wanted her to forgive this man. And so all she could do was say, Jesus, help me. And woodenly, she reached out her hand. Did you hear what I said? She reached out her hand. She didn't feel anything. She just did it in obedience. And as she reached out her hand as an act of faith and obedience, but not love. Even as she did this, she experienced God's transforming grace. She then said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. They clasped hands at that moment and the former guard and the former prisoner. She wrote, I have never known God's love so intensely. I have never known God's love. Then she realized it wasn't her love. It was the love of the Holy Spirit loving this man through her. My brothers and sisters, there comes a point when not to forgive is sin. Unforgiveness is sin. We must face what has been done to us, feel the wrong in it, but then we must release the sin and the sinner. 
we must forgive, not just because God has forgiven us, but we must forgive as God has forgiven us. Christ forgiveness is costly, not cheap. Ours will be as well. It costs because we have to give up the right to revenge or repayment. We actually pay to set the other person free, just as Christ died to set us free. Christ's forgiveness is free. It's full. It's final, not partial or provisional. There are no strings attached. Forgiveness delayed is often forgiveness denied and punishment exacted. When you continually exact psychological or emotional payment from a person, making them prove that they are sorry for what they have done, and then at some point you deem it valid and you say, I forgive you. That's not true forgiveness. You have just beat the hell out of that person. Let me also say, that there will be times when there will be no I'm sorry. Either because the person doesn't think they've done anything wrong to apologize for, or because that's just their MO. They are evil or they're selfish. And yes, you're right. They have gone off and they're doing it to somebody else or will do it to somebody else. But forgiveness is about foregoing repentance from the other person and repayment. Forgiveness is a decision. It's a choice, but it's not a one-time decision. It involves continually forgiving and letting go. Every time you think about it and realize you are not totally free. We ask God to help us forgive. And as an act of our will, we choose to forgive the person. That doesn't mean that we will immediately forget what has happened to us. It means that we're allowing God to heal us and he will. But you may have a relapse and fail to completely let go. Seeing the person pisses you off again and you just want to strangle them. Hmm. So we go back to the drawing board again and we decide to forgive again and again and again until you are free. And then there will come a time when you are completely healed. You see the person and you don't feel nothing, not a thing. You're no longer angry. You're no longer bitter. You are free. Now, you might not want to party with them, but you ain't mad no more. Mm -mm. If you say you won't be able to forgive until you forget, no, the reality is you can't forget until you forgive. You got to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. When you truly forgive, you will forget and it will be over. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. It's not a one-time act, I said earlier. This is his quote. It is a permanent attitude. And it's evident in the way that you treat the person you have forgiven. You treat them as God treats you, as if the sin had never been committed. And forgiveness is a lifelong event. We cannot just say, I forgive you and walk away. To forgive is an attitude of mercy, as I said earlier, because you're going to forgive over and over and over again. Every time you get mad, every time you think about it as an act of faith and obedience to God, which means you're connected to God's love. Because guess what, y'all? Conflicts happen every day. When you live with people, when you live by yourself, I fall out with myself regularly and I have to forgive Cynthia because you know, she's a crazy chick. 
And sometimes she can be inconsiderate of me. And I have to get her told. Then I have to forgive her and forgive myself. <laughs> it's a continual process. I wish I could tell you that you can forgive that booger and it'll be all over. No, that booger's gonna do it again, especially if he or she lives with you. You know him. Like they say, you knew what I was when you married me. You knew what I was. You know what I is, right? Finally. There's a difference between reconciliation and restoration. We may not always feel like close friends again, even though we've reached the point of reconciliation. That's because restoration hasn't taken place. This is the process that we need to think about um, when you think about the analogy of a broken bone. You know, if a leg is broken, the doctor sets the bone and the gap is healed. That's called reconciliation. This is what happens when you forgive someone. They apologize to you. They ask your forgiveness and you forgive them. And there is reconciliation. Yet in the same way, the freshly set bone is not ready to bear weight. A broken relationship, newly reconciled, often needs time and help to be restored if it is ever restored. Just as a cast and therapy is needed for complete restoration of a bone, the same is true of a relationship. Let's take a marriage where there's been infidelity and you have apologized, but your spouse is still having a difficult time. You have to realize that it's gonna take some prayer some focused time of rebuilding that broken relationship. You have to be patient, loving, and kind. The greater the fracture, the greater the recovery time. Just as a healed bone that never bears weight will never grow stronger, relationships that are avoided or neglected will ever grow stronger. There is nothing that you can't get through if you are willing to forgive. Unless there was some physical, emotional abuse, there is nothing that you can't get through. Your relationship can be healed. It will just take time. God's grace and mercy enables us to strengthen those reconciled relationships. Reconciliation is an event, but restoration is a process that slowly restores the relationship. Loving one another as God loves you. Forgiving one another as God forgives us. Takes work, but it's worth it. So which of your relationships needs to be reconciled? Are you ready to begin the process? Why or why not? What will it take for you to forgive? The song that comes to mind at this moment is all to Jesus, all to Jesus. All to Jesus I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence, daily live. You've got to be willing 
to release it all. Right now, I know your flesh is resisting. I know that everything within you says no. But allow the Spirit of God to take over in this moment, right now, and begin the process. Choose to forgive. Choose to let it go. Let's pray. God, I surrender everything to you. All my pain, all my hurt, all my bitterness, all my anger, all my unforgiveness, I give it to you. I release the person right now. And I set myself free. Thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in my heart to bring about total and complete healing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. I love you, and I'm praying for you to be totally healed and set free. Good evening, Ray of Hope Church family and friends. I am Reverend Taisha Hart and Minister of Christian Education. We want to thank our pastor, Reverend Dr. Cynthia L. Hill, for continuing to teach us in this series of The Gathering. Today we had Choose to Forgive. You do not wanna miss next Tuesday as we round up this series of The Gathering. But now it's time for small groups. Small groups is the perfect opportunity to keep the conversation going. And if you don't have a small group, we want you to look at the flyer now. You can go to www.rayahope.org Click on the link for small groups and information will be sent to you on your small group so that you can join this evening. Wake up in the morning at 714 for our weekly prayer call. You can find the information on the graphic. And if you miss it, it is posted every Wednesday on the Facebook page, website, and via email. And on Sunday, you are invited to join us for worship at 10 a.m., you can come live in the sanctuary or watch on the website, Facebook Live, or YouTube. Sunday is Go Red Sunday, and we will be raising awareness for heart disease. So stop by the tables in the vestibules after church on Sunday for blood pressure screenings, information on disease um, prevention, giveaways, and more. We hope to see you on Sunday. Have a good evening and enjoy your small group discussion. 